Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, webinar today on, on complaints. Uh, we're gonna be discussing really complaints about coming from, uh, from outside parties, interested parties, uh, that could relate to uh, issues with maybe PGLA's process, but really the focus today is gonna be on complaints we might receive from our accredited facilities. And the reason why I wanted to present on this particular topic today is, is not that I don't you know, believe that laboratories or conformity assessment bodies that we accredit really understand what a complaint is, or maybe even how to address complaints, because all of, the, all of you that are accredited or familiar with ISO accreditation standards have a requirement inside of the standard on how to address complaints through your corrective action process in response to your customers. But the point of it is, is that, you know, as, as PGLA is growing as an organization and getting into various specific industries, you know, we're, we're learning that, you know, our complaints as we get larger as a company might increase, um, again, based upon the number of laboratories that you're accrediting, but I think that you know part of this was that you know many many people in the industry believe that well if I issue this complaint and I have this opinion of this laboratory that you know the PGLA can 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 take away their accreditation and in some cases that very well very well may happen um, depending on the severity of the complaint but at the end of the day our job as an accreditor is to investigate on the issue and and attempt to address it with our laboratories and to ensure you know that they have a, a good corrective action in place to prevent these issues from occurring um, so, so that is really why i really wanted to focus in on this particular topic today uh, for those that don't that don't know me um, i am the president of pgla i actually am responsible for uh, a lot of the complaints that come in they actually come right to me and later in the presentation uh, there will be information about the general inbox to send in a complaint um, i don't handle them all directly but i do disperse them out um, but i do take a look at them to ensure you know that they're a valid complaint and and provide uh, specific direction to to the teams that are handling the complaints um, this is just a little bit of information about myself i'm not obviously going to read all that i've been with pgla as an accreditation body um, for 16 years um, and before that, I was with Perry Johnson Registrars, uh, which offers quality system standards for about six years. So I've been with the Perry Johnson family and companies now, uh, as of July, will be actually 23 years, so a pretty long time. Um, so I'm pretty familiar with the ISO requirements and quality system standards and expectations. I also serve on uh, international uh, recognition groups, such as APAC and ILAC, on uh, several of their committees, and I'm very familiar with their expectations, as well as some national programs. Just some webinar housekeeping for today. Uh, this webinar is recorded, so if you have to step off early, uh, you are always welcome to go back to our website and download a copy uh, or listen to the webinar again or share it with, with others. Uh, all attendees, as you're probably already aware, are muted. So if you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to use the questions tab, should be on your far right, and I'm gonna answer those at the end. Okay, so for today, what I'm gonna cover is uh, information that we need to be able to investigate a complaint and what our obligations are as an accrediting body. And then as we decide to investigate a complaint, what the obligations of the accredited organizations are. So just a quick view of a def, uh, definition out of right out of ISO IEC 1711. And for those that are not familiar, this is the ISO standard that the accreditation bodies, bodies have to follow. So similar to all of you who are ISO accredited to either 17025, 17020, et cetera, there is a section in 1711 that requires us to deal with complaints. So their definition here is a complaint is an expression of dissatisfaction 
other than an appeal by any person or organization. So I've highlighted that in yellow because it's important for anyone, for people to know that we can receive complaints from potentially competitors of laboratories, from other accreditation bodies about another laboratory, from anyone interested out in the industry. So it's an expression of dissatisfaction other than an appeal by any person or organization to an accreditation body relating to the activities that, accredit that the accreditation body or an accredited conformity assessment body lab where a response is expected. So again, similar to all of you who are accredited or are familiar with ISO standards, there has to be a process for documenting, investigating, and responding to the person who sent the complaint in. So typically there are really two types of complaints that that we receive. Um, one is gonna be on uh, accredited organizations of our, co our companies we accredit. So those can be labs or inspection bodies, proficiency testing bodies, whichever. And typically most of our complaints uh, derive from inaccurate reporting, inaccurate use of PGLA's accreditation symbol or claim of accredited work, unethical behavior, or poor practices. So the last two bullet points are really tough, um, to be honest, for us to uh, really investigate because typically we, we go to the laboratories every year, we haven't seen a problem. A lot of times these bullet points come from, uh, we can call them whistleblowers or people that maybe have been let go from a laboratory. So all these things we take into consideration so we really have to dig hard um, and, and try to make a decision whether or not we're really gonna investigate certain things. If there is uh, information or evidence, so unethical behavior could be, or poor practices could be that maybe someone has falsified a result and there's clear evidence and they provided that, that's a little bit of a different story. Um, but when someone comes to us and says, well, th this, this person just treats everyone poorly in the lab and there's this going on. There's not much we really can do about that. Um, so those are those are really two points that are somewhat difficult to, to really investigate. Um, the most common one I would say we get is probably bullet point one and two, um, probably two being the highest where someone will contact us and state that this organization provided me a credited report with the PGLA symbol and it is not on their scope of accreditation. And I asked for it to become accredited and I spoke to the laboratory and they said that it wasn't in my contract that we told you we were doing unaccredited work. So there it, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a gray area. Well, if the contract said that they were doing unaccredited work, that might be possibly okay. Or, you know, what really was the conversation between the two? Or there are laboratories that might go out and just clearly issue the symbol and, you know, mislead the market. So I would say bullet point two was probably the largest um, amount of complaints that we get that, that could get resolved pretty, pretty easily. The tough thing with that particular complaint, though, is that in most cases, if laboratories have issued accredited reports for non accredited items on their certificate of accreditation by us, you know, they are required to go back and make revisions. So it, it is something that, you know, we do webinars on the use of accreditation symbols and language quite a bit that we really, really try to let laboratories know to please be cautious of this because it really could cause a lot of rework, revisions, upset customers. The second type of complaints we get um, our complaints about PGLA services, that, that could happen. So not only do we have a procedure here to handle issues that we might hear complaints about our credit organizations, but PGLA is not perfect at all times. We might have people that provide complaints to us. Maybe they weren't happy with something that happened with the process, or maybe they weren't happy with something hap you know, that happened during the assessment with the assessor. So we have a process here just like our laboratories do to answer complaints. We, I, I actually encourage organizations to please that there's something that went wrong with our assessment or with our process. I, I don't mind taking a corrective action on that. I want you to send something in. 
And even if you just call to talk to me about it, we do have a process that, that I might decide to say, we want to do an internal corrective action on this type of activity because we don't want these things to keep to keep continuing. So those are the two types of complaints, uh, you know, that we deal with for the most part. So obligations for PGLA. Um, and so everyone is aware there is a, there is this process. You know, we don't typically pull accreditations away. When we get a complaint right away, I think we might have done that maybe once or twice, depending on, on the issue. Um, but we do have to have a process for documenting the complaint, investigating it, and then a process for responding. Uh, we have a procedure that is available for the public and for our laboratories on our website. There's the link there, SOP9. And that, that's going to uh, you know, cover what we're going over today. We also, when we get a complaint in from an outside party about one of our accredited organizations, one of the things that as if it's appropriate to do so is have you actually talked to the laboratory about this and have you tried to have them resolve it? Because at the end of the day, we don't own the lab. We don't know what exactly your contract was at that moment. And wouldn't it be easier for you to let the laboratory know that you're dissatisfied with something instead of coming to us? Now, if the laboratory doesn't respond or maybe they give a very uh, poor response in your opinion, you know, we could take a look at that and help follow up with the issue. But again, 1711, they require us to have organizations, groups, work with each other first before we get involved. Also, when we investigate complaints as an accreditation body, we also want to make sure impartiality isn't compromised when investigating. So if I get a, a complaint and, for example, uh, it is something on PGLA processes and it's uh, one of my technical program managers or operations managers, who directly manages that area, I wouldn't ask them to investigate this complaint. We would talk to them about it, but we would have someone else uh, take the appropriate corrective action, uh, similar to just how uh, 17025 requires that, that separation. Same thing, obviously, with an assessor. We obviously wouldn't be asking the assessor to take their own corrective action. So again, our goal here is, is to correct and, and move forward. Um, our goal is not to take complaints and remove accredited laboratories or organizations from our listing of, of, of uh, contracted companies. You know, we want you know, the process to work well. We still wanna do the investigation. We wanna do appropriate follow up whether that's an extra visit and you know to monitor the corrective action taken you know by the conformity assessment bodies of the labs um, and, and help them get through it in most cases uh, when we get a complaint and there is an issue we don't find that the that the laboratory has done something really intentional and it's a, an error they have that's that was caught in between our assessments and they just need to take a corrective action. Um, we do evaluate complaints every year, though, before uh, an assessment takes place again to make sure that the assessor is aware that there was a complaint that was documented and to kind of keep their eye on it. But again, our goal here is to, you know, if there is an issue that someone sees, every organization should have the freedom, the ability to be able to correct and just move on. So if, if you are uh, sending a complaint to PGLA, uh, we do require that we have your name and your contact information, even your associated company. We have had issues where, or not issues, or requests um, that some uh, folks that wanted to uh, form a complaint wanted to remain anonymous, and we do accept that. Uh, we want the details of the complaint specifically. If it's too vague, I can't help. I can't do the investigation. And if you have evidence, you know, to provide the evidence if it's available. Again, the more information we have, 
the better off we are um, to be able to fully investigate the complaint and, and make that uh, help make the laboratory uh, you know, in compliance and have them take their corrective action. Everyone does need to be made aware too, is that you know, some, at times we do get anonymous complaints and they do provide us the information, but I don't know who I'm talking to. So, you know, and they don't want to go to the laboratory themselves. So I'm, we are very limited in what we can tell uh, people that are sending in complaints because we do have strict confidentiality agreements with our customers. So the response, for example, could be, thank you very much. Yes, your complaint is, is valid. Uh, we have done our, you know, used our procedure here to uh, investigate a complaint with this uh, particular laboratory and we'll request them to take all appropriate corrective action as necessary. So the only thing I can tell them is that we are investigating at that point, because again, we don't know who we're talking to. So we're very cautious about that. Um, even laboratories have uh, been told that we received that they wanted to remain anonymous, even though we knew who the person was. Um, and even that makes it a very uncomfortable situation, um, you know, to deal with with the laboratory. It really does. Again, going back to a few slides, that's why we really, really encourage people to uh, please contact the laboratory directly to let them respond to something. So when we get the information, there's a few things that we like to look for is, does the complaint relate to the scope of PGLA services or PGLA's accredited organization? So if there is an issue with, let's, let's just give an example, a laboratory is testing, uh, performing, uh, I'm just gonna call something out here, hardness testing. And this complaint came in and said, well, they had an issue with how they calibrated my micrometers. Well, we don't accredit them for micrometers. So we really can't focus in on that area. However, if there's something that's related in general, we might be able to say, well, I know this is not on your accredited scope. We might ask to make sure that the report that was given to this person didn't use our symbol, uh, just, just to confirm. But if it's something that's an ethical practice or something that's, you know, a general 17025 requirement, it very well could turn into some type of complaint investigation. But if it's over something that they perform my calibration incorrectly, for example, we don't accredit them for calibration, then it's nothing we can do at that point. We also look, do we have the appropriate and relevant information to, to really investigate? Um, there's times where, again, you know, we might receive random emails. Um, you know, I don't have, a, I need to have specific information. So, for example, if there's an issue with a test report, would well, I even have a customer name? Do I have a test report? Or is this in general someone has a problem with, example, how a laboratory is testing for THC? You know, so we have to look at all those things. So, again, the more information we have, the better investigation we can do. And then we also look at where did this come from? We could get it from a regulatory body, another organization in the industry. It could be from possibly a competitor of ours that is informing us of an issue. So we do look at all of these things and consider all these when we're doing our investigation. A lot of times if it comes from a regulatory group, excuse me, <coughs> for example, let's say FDA or a state for cannabis testing, you know, we do take treat those a little bit differently and consider, you know, looking at what exactly is the issue. In some cases, <clears throat> there are requirements of regulatory organizations that have nothing to do with our ISO accreditation. So we have to also look at that. One second, everyone. Sorry about that. We also have to look at that um, and consider 
you know, is this something that we really can investigate or is it really a regulatory state specific requirement? And here's some items here of things that we won't investigate. Uh, so non ISO related matters, anything related to pricing, cost issue, et cetera. We get a lot of, uh, sometimes you get random calls on, you know, this laboratory is charging way less than we are. It's impossible and they're uh, hurting us in the market. And I think they're doing this or doing that. And, and it's, we really can't get involved with that or, Maybe they're 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 testing and I'm losing and they're taking all of my customers. I mean, those are things we really we really can't get in the middle of. Uh, personal internal issues unless they impact the validity of the conformity assessment results, rumors, articles, social media, magazines, and if a company comes to us and says, and this could happen a lot with regulatory or state organizations, is that. They can come to us and say this this organization wasn't doing this and this is what this uh my state requires well we would look at it and say well this is not what 17025 requires we really can't look at this any further because you haven't asked us to do your state requirements plus the iso 17025 requirements so there's not much more we can really do with that um so again, these are the points that we look at, and then we we will respond back to the person and explain ourselves why why we can't get involved with that, and maybe even propose again to talk to the facilities or uh, you know if they can. Obviously, not about pricing or cost, but in some of these things, you know, they can reach out to laboratories directly. But once we determine the complaint is valid. Uh, this doesn't mean necessarily, if it's a valid complaint and we have information, it doesn't mean that uh, there necessarily is an issue though either. Sometimes we will say, this is not a valid complaint. We're gonna go ahead and document this. Uh, we will be back to you in probably about 30 to 60 days, depending on the issue and let you know uh, what the result was. In most cases, if it's a complaint on a conformity assessment body or laboratory, uh, you know, we will let them know that we've, we've been, uh, taken the corrective action. If we have your name and we, and we are able to inform the laboratory of who you are, you know, a lot of times the, we will provide the whole corrective action, um, that was completed by the laboratory to address the complaint. Um, and then also we will inform them that you, if it's related to a test report or something, um, usually the the person who's complaining will usually get a revision of a, a test report or a response directly from the laboratory themselves we do have a logging system where we do log the complaints um, in our internal drive and again put time time frames on those uh, to make sure they're getting addressed within at least 30 to 60 days so if we do get a complaint from someone um, about one of our customers, you know, we we do work as a team to determine how do we want to contact our customer about it. So the customer is informed of a, of the complaint that was uh, formed, uh, and and we might ask them for for things to help support or to help our investigation. So that could be. Uh, maybe some data, copy of certificates. I mean, all these things here that, you know, that could relate to the to typical complaints so we can start our investigation. And if you find a problem, uh, we might, you know, we then would take further action such as, okay, this is an issue here. I asked you for a copy of this last, my previous example, a copy of this micrometer calibration report. Uh, someone had, had stated that you were misleading them, um, can you show me a copy of that? And then I see that the PGLA symbol is listed on it or accreditation number, and it's not on the copy of the certificate. So there we would say, okay, this is a violation of this SOP3, please take corrective action and take this appropriate action um, as far as revising your certificates and evaluate your system. 
We also might ask during that time, can we see a copy of your contract with your customers, how you're informing them of non-accredited work that does happen versus accredited work if that was in the actual contract. So there are all these things that we will do. Um, again, we're, we're, we're trying to make sure we could fully investigate uh, these situations, whether it could be through a discussion and maybe some information and then maybe there's no no corrective action required at all because we actually find out and then we would get back to the person complaining and saying actually this is why this was done and there's no further action on this laboratories and this complaint is uh is not it's not really a valid complaint um because of this situation so we do try to help filter that out a little bit So the obligations of organizations that are under investigation. So uh, laboratories that are uh, have been notified that they have a complaint that's been filed on something they have done. Um, we do ask them to participate. And this is actually included in our SOP one, which is our accreditation procedure, as well as the uh, agreement for services that all of our clients sign that they will agree to participate in complaints. So these are things that, uh, you know, again, we would expect them most likely to do is issue, provide us a corrective action plan within so much time, uh, provide data or other information, other information needed to evaluate the issue. Uh, some, some clients might have to notify their clients of any report revisions. Some cases we've had laboratories stop testing or calibrating because we needed to do an on-site investigation and until that was done, that we were concerned about the validity of the results and they needed to hold on testing. And then obviously allow PGLA to investigate the issue on site if necessary. So uh, if we decide that we need an on-site assessment that the organization must allow us to come, to come on and do that. If an organization fails to partici participate in the investigation, uh, so we planned on asking them to just provide us information and that might be enough to, to evaluate an issue and they fail to do that, we could go on site and have a, a special on site investigation. It could lead to a suspension of accreditation or a partial scope being removed, or it could lead to a full withdrawal of accreditation and termination of contract. Uh, so the organ it's really important for organizations to respond. Uh, we make every attempt. Usually it's a, uh, a call first, and then we also do a follow-up email. And if we've contacted you multiple times and you fail to respond to an open issue, we then have, uh, you then have raised, I guess, a red flag, um, or we're a little suspicious of the issue, and we could uh, suspend your accreditation. So it's just really important to participate in these types of things. So once the complaint is, is completed and it's closed, uh, we will provide a response back uh, to the complaining party about you know, whatever situation is, whether it's PGLA's process or uh, the conformity assessment body process. And if the laboratory is going to provide, which they should, um, and they know who the customer is who's complaining, you know, we will ask them to confirm that they received, say, for example, revised reports on the on a particular issue, or they felt that the you know the response provided by the organization was acceptable. So we'll, we will ask for that confirmation. Again, if someone remains anonymous, there's not much we really will provide to them other than that. that We've uh, accepted your complaint and we're going to take corrective action on our part. Encourage again for them to contact the organization directly, um, but we wouldn't provide them uh, a lot of information related to what the laboratory did if we did ask them to take a corrective action. Because again, if there wants to remain anonymous with us as well as the lab, it, it makes it very difficult um, for us to really communicate much on it. It's really more of uh, we'll, we'll start the investigation and deal with the organization, but other than that, again, we don't know who we're talking to.
Now there are some, uh, there is a, a to say a difference between how do I report a concern versus a, a complaint. There are some organizations that they really don't want to report an official complaint and it could be uh, because they really don't have enough solid evidence. Maybe for example, data from the laboratory, maybe they have a copy of a report, but they really don't have all of that information. You could still send it in. Um, we're not going to ignore it. We're still going to look at it. And if, for example, this, this is very common in the cannabis industry. If um, a laboratory is reporting a very high amount of THC, which is, you know, not, not a very common industry practice, it's something that we would say, okay, take a look at this. You know, not saying it can be, it's completely impossible, but it's something that the assessment should know about. And what's follow up on this or which, you know, maybe we should just ask the lab for a copy of, um, you know, other data just to just to make sure everything lines up on how they did something. We might decide to issue a non-conformance to the facility on our own and again, follow up on the next visit. So complaints rarely result in their suspension or withdrawal of accreditation. So back to the title of my of my presentation is I sent this complaint in and why is this laboratory still accredited? This was this was horrible thing that they've done and I don't think they deserve to be accredited. So there's I believe you know people out there that really believe that um, you know we don't find everything on every assessment, so it is difficult. Um, you know, to find the laboratories that, you know, could be considered the, the bad labs and do things without, uh, when we're not there, uh, we do our best to try to pull as much information as possible to do a good sampling. Uh, but again, you know, we have to give our laboratories the benefit of the doubt and to address it with them and ask them to take corrective action. Um, if we find that it's, it's a pretty severe issue though, for example, if they're falsifying results and we find it across the board or we maybe are interviewing people and it's apparent that they have been trained to uh, again falsify information I mean that's something that's a little bit different to where that would be a termination of accreditation that we we no longer couldn't have that relationship with the facility and um, you know they don't deserve to be accredited but in most most cases organizations that uh, make errors out there and we don't see it during our assessments. Again, it's not really an intentional thing. And eventually they, you know, will take the corrective action and, and move forward. Uh, again, we encourage interested parties to reach out to us about the industry. Um, we can do our best. Again, if you don't have a lot of information, there's sometimes there's things we might not be able to address very quickly or we take it with us on the next assessment. But we also encourage the industry to work together whenever possible. Uh, remember, credit organizations also have a complaint process for a reason and people should use that. So if a laboratory, again, is accredited to ISO, they have a process for addressing complaints. They need to be able to respond to you first, whoever it is. And if they don't, then we ask you to please come to us and we can step in. Um, so that usually is a question we will ask people that come come to us with complaints. Have you talked to this facility? And if they have a good reason for not doing it, we will accept that and we can investigate it ourselves. But if you don't, and it's one of your customers, our laboratory is your customer, please let them use their complaint process system. Any complaints regarding an accredited organization or issue with our process can be sent right to PJ Labs at pjlabs.com. That actually comes directly to me, or you can call and uh, the complaint, and I can take the call complaint over the phone. I, I do prefer them in writing, um, especially if there's objective evidence that goes with the complaint. Um, here's my contact information uh, directly if you have any questions about today's presentation. And I think we're gonna have some time for questions and answers. So I'll give you a couple seconds here so I can download uh, the questions.
or you can go ahead and type uh, a question in if you have it. And as you're doing that, I, I just wanted to bring your attention to a couple upcoming webinars. We're pretty busy here in June. Uh, June 13th, we're going to be doing a webinar on understanding the types of reference materials, their differences and uses by Matt Sika, one of our testing program managers. And on Tuesday, June 27th, uh, we are changing our policy for scopes of accreditation. Uh, that will be going out to all of our accredited organizations very soon, I'm hoping by Friday. Um, so everyone then can to re, we'll get a copy of what's been changed, but also this webinar will go over uh, just an overview of it as well. All right, so let's see what kind of questions we have. Okay, we did have a question if a lab is notified of a complaint is made against it. Um, so I think I covered this already in my uh, presentation that yes, the laboratory is gonna be notified if there was a complaint that came in. Um, so the laboratory will have an opportunity to be able to respond uh, particularly to that complaint. Okay, another question that we got is what happens if the lab doesn't agree with the, the process PGLA has taken? So one of the things we do have, but I didn't cover today, is we also have on our website a appeal procedure. So for example, if PGLA decides that due to the severity of the complaint and after investigation that we've suspended the accreditation in full, which would be a pretty severe issue. The organization would, uh, in that letter, they would get a letter from us. And they would have the right to uh, use PGLA's dispute and appeal procedure on that decision. And that's a whole different process uh, where we would have an investigation team to ensure that uh, the decision that PGLA made um, was a valid decision. Uh, if there was something wrong with our decision, uh, then it could get overturn possibly, um, but just like non-conformances, uh, the assessor tells you now that you have the right to dispute or appeal a finding after the assessment. It's the same process uh, for this as well. Another question we had is, what if a lab has multiple complaints over time? So this is something that uh, we do take in consideration uh, when we, get our complaints in. Sometimes complaints can be different things, but if it is a complaint, say for example, in 12 months and it's the same complaint, or it could be different issues within the laboratory, then it is something we do have to look at, um, whether it would be, do we do more assessments? Do we ask the lab to report frequently on this issue? Or perhaps um, is the lab really deserving of, of being accredited? So there's all these considerations we do uh, take into account. I don't think we've really ever, uh, we don't have it very often where labs have more, more than one complaint uh, on different issues. We've had issues in the past where we've had a laboratory uh, on the same issue receive multiple complaints from different interested parties. And, and that caused us to do a little bit more of a rigorous type of investigation with an, with an on-site assessment. Okay, so I think that's all the questions we have for today. I don't see any more that popped in. You can email me if you uh, if anything comes up that you're curious about. I'd be happy to get back to you on that. Okay, all right. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today, um, and we look forward to having you on our next webinars coming up in a couple of weeks. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.